thank you for taking the time to meet with me today, Marvin. Uh, please tell us your full name, a little bit about where you were born, your family of origin, and where you grew up. Uh, you're welcome, first of all, Bruce. And my full name, I'm Marvin John Taller, and I was born and raised in Long Branch, New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore. It's about 50 miles northeast, or rather southeast of New York City, right on the ocean. Um, my parents are, I guess they would call African American, both of them African American. And I grew up in a small beach town, mixed neighborhood next door. My neighbors were African American across the street. We had a Puerto Rican family down the street. There was a family, uh, the wife was Korean and the husband was African American. Um, so I grew, and I grew up in a mixed kind of multiracial environment. How many siblings? Oh, and I have one sister, I have an older sister. Uh, she's three years older than I am. And uh, that's it, there's four of us. What, if any, religion were you raised in? Um, my mother is a Jehovah's Witness, and she's still a practicing Jehovah's Witness, so I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. Now, one thing I really like about that particular faith and religion is that, unlike other uh, traditions, you have to choose to be baptized, so my mother was baptized. I've never been baptized into one religion. Um, you have to make a conscious choice and say yes. And um, when I was about seven years old, I realized that there were things that weren't in alignment with who I was and, and what I believed about God, which is just this huge subject. And I knew that I wasn't going to be uh, baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, but I was raised in that tradition I did not celebrate holidays, Christmas, Halloween, birthdays, Easter, uh, which made for an interesting childhood for me. Why did you choose not to take baptism? There was this feeling that I had inside of me. You know, all religions believe that they're the, a lot of religions, I should say all, a lot of religions believe that they're the only path to God. And that was one thing about the, that particular faith, even as a young child, that I didn't understand, it didn't make sense to me. Um, it's actually called, considered the truth. They say, this is the truth. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're following the truth. And, and everyone just, else is following the false. Exactly. <laughs> and so that just didn't seem right to me. That there were, it just, I know that you could take a number of different ways to come home from places as a kid. We could go to the grocery store and there'd be like three different ways to come home. I'm, there's more than that now. So how could there just be one path to knowing God? And as a kid, everyone else is celebrating Christmas. Why we like we're the one, like we're the guys who figured this out. We're that smart. So just just didn't sit right in my in, in my my body. I understand it can be troubling that, well, I believe it was John Lennon who said, how can anybody be right if everybody's wrong? Absolutely, absolutely. it just, you know, and when I think about it, it, you know, it's like being this little kid and you have these friends and people you go to school with and you're not really encouraged to hang with, hang out with people world outside. kids outside, but you have some nice people to meet and you're basically being told, they're gonna die because the end of the world's coming. They don't serve Jehovah and they're gonna die. And that just, why would a loving God, even as a kid, I, I, I look back now, even as a kid, how, why would a loving God kill people and punish people? And as I've gotten older, these, these simple, they're simple questions and they actually have simple answers, but there's so much depth in them. Like, like these are the questions and believe me, you could not ask, I could not ask this question of, my mother or, or any of the elders because you'd be a blasphemer yeah an apostate I think there, there is their term apostate that yeah. is the right word yeah do you have any post-secondary education oh yes I uh, am a graduate of Rutgers Law School so I have a Juris Doctorate degree are you a member of any bar um, no that it was my I had situations with bars but I've never not been a member of a bar association. What's your undergraduate degree in? My undergraduate degree, I, I went to Southern Connecticut State University and I have a degree in corporate communications. Why did you choose to study law? Well, Bruce, it's about a girl. 
Isn't it always? <laughs> Isn't it always? I, I can actually um, wonderfully and, and joyfully admit that despite being very bright, I think I'm intelligent. I have the test scores to prove it. Not that I don't believe in tests, but I'm, I'm reasonably intelligent. And But it took me six years to finish my undergraduate degree. And what had happened was I met a young lady. She was going to law school. Since the time she was five years old, she was going to law school. Her mother, interesting story, you know, in my multicultural background, she was the, she was adopted by a woman, a Jewish woman who was a philosophy professor at the college I was attending at the time. And the child, she was uh, African-American, and I mean, she was Jamaican and Polish, so she was of mixed descent. But her mother raised her, did a wonderful job, and because and her mother, her mother couldn't go to law school, so her daughter was gonna go to law school. So she knew she was going to law school. So I'm hanging out with her, and she went to a really good university. She went to uh, Wesleyan University. So I was hanging out with kids who went to Yale and Wesleyan and these, these little Ivy schools like Smith and Tufts. And I'm hanging with these kids, and I'm like, I'm at least as smart, I'm reasonably as smart as they are. And they were all going to med school, grad school, MBAs. So the summer of my before my senior year in college i decided to take the lsats and i took the lsats and i got accepted to law school why did you become a trainer uh i, I was an athlete i was an athlete I, I originally went to school on a track scholarship I, I used i ran in high school and as our local writer saw me a couple of months ago he said this is marvin tell he was a track star at monmouth college i never considered myself a track star but i love to physical fitness, I, and it wasn't, it was because I was competing, it wasn't like being a trainer, uh, that came later, but just, I, I'm, I'm a sports guy when I was a kid. I so won. you exercised in order to be able to win? Uh, yeah, as most people do, you know, because I had a six pack, when I had a six pack, it wasn't about a six pack, it was just a, it was a byproduct of competing, you know. So, I, you know, I, I, I ran, I trained. Of all of the many, many forms of workout available to you, why did you choose Hapkido? Great, great question. Well, that is one of those stories where I remember after being an athlete, I fell into a period of my life in law school where, well, I, I always drank a lot, even when I was running. Looking back, I probably could have ran to achieve some more if I had uh, not drank as much. <clears throat> I started smoking in law school because my girlfriend smoked. Um, and I did a lot of drugs. And so I, there was a long period where I stopped working out. However, I remember sitting in a friend's apartment in 1998 on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And at that time I was in the wine business, which was licensed to drink. And where it's like, where it's like 2.30 in the morning, we just come back from the bar and we're watching TV and an infomercial comes on for Billy Blank's Tybo. And I'm just sitting there um, drinking and smoking and said to myself, I can do that. Flash forward to 2003, five years later, I found myself, I crashed hit bottom. I, my run was over and I went into a martial arts studio to take a kickboxing class like Taibo, a 10-week kickboxing class where you could, if you really apply yourself, you get those results, you know, those before and afters that when things are airbrushed, I'll actually have photos like that that are real. And after I went through the 10-week program, um, I was funneled into the martial arts program. And it basically was something I always wanted to do. And it's one of those things where I couldn't do martial arts when I was a child because it was a combat sport and I was a Joe Witness. And so and I always wanted to do it. And it just came about when I got sober and decided to deal with my life head on that I had this wonderful tool that looking back I'd always been a runner that was my sport and now I was learning to stand where I was and not necessarily fight but stand my ground and be able to respond to the situation so it, it's one of those divine intervention things. Are you a member of a 12-step fellowship? I am Don't not say the name of it if you are. Yeah. Um, no, however, I have attended twelve step fellowships, and and they were and they are the reason why I did get sober. It was. It, it, I, but you feel like you graduated. I do actually. I feel like I graduated, and and that's and I can say that, and I say that because in the twelve step programs, it is about having conscious contact with a, a power or something greater than yourself, and it has been inside of that inquiry that journey 
that, you know, that I have, I wouldn't say graduated, I mean, that's your term, but I have now branched out into other areas of deeper inquiry into spirituality, is what I would say, and expanding on the 12 step traditions. Well, that's just the 11th step. There you go. So, so that was a setup. <laughs> you never graduate. <laughs> Not in my world, you would never graduate. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, I, I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I, I can't really say I graduated, but I think that things are open at the top. One of the things, because of my experience, everything's based on our experience. We try to be present in the moment, but, but on my experience, anytime I get caught up in there's one way, I, you know, and what has emerged is I, I've studied um, the founder of one of the more famous fellowships. Which we're going to get to. In a, oh, you mean AA? Yeah. Okay. I thought you meant Holmes. Oh, yeah. No. And um, recently I found out that there was a schism between him, his vision, and what happened once they brought the doctors in. And it became this rigid kind of program where he still had it open the top as something that was evolving. And, um, you know, it's laid out, this is it. And he, he got involved in... Um, my area, which is um, the role of nutrition in sobriety and addiction. So, it, and I just found out a few weeks ago on some own research. So, it was, it was pretty interesting to see that he was going in a different direction. He was kind of shunned by the board of AA in his latter years for because he felt that people got sober and a lot of them were still depressed. And and for me, the movement and we're gonna, the movement that really helped me when I was getting sober was getting back in shape because as I was detoxing. I didn't know if I was getting in shape or detoxing, so all that pain just kind of went out of my body and it helped really re restore and regenerate my cells. And uh, he was really, he got heavily into vitamin therapy and he really wanted people to begin to um, move out and live beyond just the program, so. He got into vitamin L there a little bit too. From he, did get into, he did get into that. Um, and that's a whole other interesting thing too, but, uh, but the big thing was he met a guy named Abraham Hoffer from Canada who put him on uh, niacin. Which, which knocks out depression, there's studies on it. Please tell us a little bit about the Holmes Institute and your involvement with it. Sure, the uh, Ernest Holmes, the Holmes Institute is named after Ernest Holmes, who is um, one of the premier thinkers, thought leaders in the, in the New Thought, Ancient Wisdom, or uh, movement, um, also known as Science of Mind, not to be confused with Scientology. Um, and he was just this, visionary person who laid down some principles that he that he felt were given to him to distribute to the world about how they can live life powerfully. Please outline for us the basic principles that they believe in. Um, the basic principle would be that we are all one, that that we that that the greatest secret in the world is that God lives inside of each and every one of us. And that's in the scripture, but it's not interpreted that way. So what that means in the principle, we're all one, we're all connected. We live in this um, sphere of consciousness. We live in consciousness. Our world is created by our thoughts. Thought precedes form. So when you take conscious, when you consciously control your thoughts, you can create your world because we have the same creative power, power that God uses within us. And then as we speak our word, things that come to manifestation because God is expressing in through and as us. We're all one. We're in this omnipotent, omnipresent um, substance. When someone demonstrates success,